Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Hey, Professor. Good. Good. How about yourself? Good. So, when do you start at Infosys? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, on the twenty fifth. Oh, okay. Well, good for you. I I'm think I, I think it's gonna be all. Yeah, I think it's gonna be all onboarding. I mean, I mean, all uh, on online. Oh, remote. So are you, are you able to do that and the apprenticeship as well? I just wanted to check with your schedule before I talk to Jennifer, because you're ready to go. Yeah, oh, I'm ready. To, um, the, I don't know yet since I haven't got my, my, I mean, I'm sure I can do it on the weekends for sure, but I don't know how, how the companies are going to. Okay, gonna so if you hear from Jennifer, make sure that you let her know about your criteria so that way she can yeah. select the appropriate employer. I think most okay. of them are looking for part time, um, but the majority of them are looking to do operational hours, which is, you know, the typical eight to five somewhere fitting in between there. Um, yeah. But it doesn't mean I know hospital runs on the weekends as well. So mm -hmm. think about maybe we should line you up with the, some of the healthcare people um, like Loma Linda or something like that. And I yeah, think that's- for sure. Okay. I will yeah, talk, I'll to, talk to Jennifer. She, yeah, yeah if, she, if she reached me out before you, you, you touch base with her, I'll let her know. Okay, no problem. So I was able to put together a small team that's competing for the California Mayor's Cup. I don't know nice. if they're gonna want to do the NCL one. Um, right now, they're getting ready for the Saturday to do the California. I think NCL. I think NCL. The the the, 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 the I think it's already over for. for I thought for. no, they they have another game starting. They sent me an email regarding. Oh, you did. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I, from I, what I, I Skip told that. me. Skip told me that they have another thing starting um, at like the week, next week or something like that. Yeah. But, you know, I'm just juggling so many different things. So I like, I try not to get more stuff on my plate, but right now, like, you know, if they enjoy it, if they want to, then I'll support them on it. But yeah, you know, so I ordered I, them I wish some sweatshirt yep nice now i wish i could have participated but i i just everything just came crashing down this year <laughs> at the last minute so, yeah <laughs> well that's even, even, even for what walk on i haven't I had a withdraw from the latest class because i couldn't get the student my, my 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 freaking um virtual box to work and i was already getting too stressed out so i had a drop I had a withdraw from the Linux class. What? And you the, you yeah. you got the virtual box to work for my class. So which hey, Linux are they using? Know. Red Hat? No, they were using Mint. Oh, ew. <laughs> no, I mean yeah. Mint is okay for use, but in, mm -hmm. in virtual environment that can be a little challenging. I got Mint to work on mine like last year. So no. um so, well, yeah, so with VirtualBox, make sure you mount the disk because if it, you don't have it imported and mounted or appliance imported, it's it's not it's not gonna work. But yeah, well, yeah but it's all right. I mean, it's it's it, it was it, after I withdrew my my workload was less and less stressful. But even then, I mean, I, I'm I'm out of the stress now that I got the job because that's <laughs> what I was working for. Well, that's the the silver lining at the end right but yeah. no matter how hard the job gets it's a good learning experience for everyone so um you know you accommodate they're not gonna throw you to the wolves they're gonna train you so uh, yeah. but you know make sure you ask questions if you don't know and you know so yeah for sure yeah we'll start in a minute i hope you guys don't get devastated because things don't work out with gsm3 or what not i'm flexible i'm looking for another solution on cloud so um i'll play with aws i contacted the rep and they haven't responded to me i previously used aws educate 
but um, and it will be real quick for us just to terminal in, run the script, and then leave. So we won't. The only thing that probably requires some time on AWS is to kind of set it up. Um, some of you had experience that when you took CIS 25 or 27 with me, but you know, right now I think that will probably be best if if you know if we look at uh, options that will be cloud based. I tried the Cisco Cloud Dev uh, DevNet. It 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 is not responding as I I wanted, like I told you last time. But um, for the lab that you're finishing this week from last week. Um, you know, if you don't get your GSN3 to work, don't worry about it. I want you to be able to at least write the program and then, you know, just submit it like that. So that way you understand how the structure of the program will work. Um, this week, I'm testing it with the Linux virtual machine. So if you have the Linux virtual machine already working previously for Ubuntu, we can try that. But if you have your GSN3 working from last week, you can also use that as well, okay? Um, okay, all right, let's talk about what we need to do and I'm gonna go into screen share, let me minimize some of the stuff I was working on. So this week we're gonna talk about Ansible, which is a framework that, um, that you would use for the networking area. Okay, yeah, no problem, Seth. So with Ansible, um, you probably heard me mention some of the framework that, that and if you watch tutorial videos online, um, there are other frameworks that will work in a network environment, uh, depending on the organization and the developer. Um, so we're gonna touch on Ansible in that it has, um, it's a great module that you can utilize with your Python knowledge and it allows us to pick up with the API that we talked about. And the way that we use the automation is to really use it to fill out some of the configuration information or even setting up scheduling process. For example, like if you use Ansible for server, you can run it, um, you can create an automated file so that way it will do a backup for multiple servers for you. Um, you can set it up to sync, especially when you're doing data syncing, dealing with databases. Um, you can, um, in the example in the book, they, he mainly, the author mainly addresses the, the automation in the networking devices, but Ansible is used in a lot of other areas. And, it was created mainly for server administration. And then a lot of the companies started, a lot of different um, administrator wanted to utilize it for network devices. And so the community came back to vendors and they were able to expand the module or the library to work with, to work with um, network devices that are commonly found like Cisco, Juniper and Arista that we would see at the data center. So the book really addresses the network appliances, but I think that there are a lot more potential. So what can you do to really test this environment in, in, your, in your system, right? In your, at your home. Um, if you have a couple of Raspberry Pi laying around, you can set up one to communicate with another one and you can automate it with Raspberry Pis. If you can use, Linux virtual machines and automate across different virtual machines to test. Um, you can use GSN3 when you can add in the appliances. Again, we have to nest the virtual machine in such case because the GSN3 virtual machine is actually the server that's gonna run the images for all your appliances. And if you have a hard time using this as appliance in GSN3, you can use other iOS uh, which is the older operating system that Cisco uses for the older appliances like routers, switches, et cetera. They still use those, but the newer appliances, you would see that they would come with the NX OS or some kind of operating system that would have an interface 
And with that, it would have the development side for the Python and JSON, um, as we talked about last week. So this week, we're going to touch on Ansible. And Ansible is a framework that help us simplify the process for a lot of different things in an infrastructure. So when I talk about infrastructure, as I mentioned last time in the time prior, I, I would include right all the communication devices, um, some of the servers, and those servers can hold different roles um, from database to web to uh, authentication to a lot of different areas. And so the example that we see is mainly for network systems, which is made for use for communication. But we have to think about how the business logic would be implemented for other type of system in operation. So um, to really streamline the process to automate all different types of systems from all different vendors, the industry or the community, Ansible community and other community for frameworks decided that they wanted to build something that would work across, that will be commonly used across all different type of devices, especially when we're working with hardware. So when you're looking at Puppet or when you're looking at Ansible, you would know that this is they are frameworks to be used to for different purposes, especially when we're working with multiple types of systems um, and each of those systems would have specific requirements. So Ansible is used to configure system. It can be used to deploy software. It can coordinate tasks or multiple tasks. So in later part of the notes, it talks about the playbook and the playbook is really used to to execute tasks. Um, so we need to talk about how we would write this in Python and also using YAML, okay? So at the beginning of the notes, it talks about how Ansible would be a declarative framework. And the version that you want to use is version 2.5 or later. And if you check the documentation, um, it has like, I think they're at 2.8x. So you can find the latest version and Ansible works with Python 2.7 and Python 3. Um, so if you are running Python 3, you need to check, check out the documentation for Python 3. And then if your company or your organization uses 2.7, then you would want to accommodate that, okay? So here it gives you a little bit of information about Ansible to start with. Now, when you use Ansible, you want to have a control node using a Linux operating system. As you know, a lot of these tools are written for Linux systems um, and it was built with a lot of the open source elements. So now, once you have the control node, which is going to manage all the other system and all the other devices, then you can use it to control a Windows system, okay? Like a Windows server, a Windows client, um, etc. Okay, it will not work directly on Windows operating system if you want to use that as a control node, and in administration, we would have a hierarchical structure, meaning that we would have one system that's gonna be controlling the rest. So if you think about that, right? Like let's take it into an aspect of a wireless environment. Um, you would have, let's say a company would have 20 access point. And in order to manage those access point, you have to have a control node, right? One system, one or one device that's going to control the rest of them. And a lot of the times people would use, would revert back to server or some type of computer system to be able to manage the rules, the requirement, the encryption for the, the, the wireless access point. So in that same concept, if you take that and bring it into a network environment or even, you know, 
for at home use. You can set up a control system that's running Linux and you can automate the task for all the other systems that are connected if you configure the other system to communicate accordingly. And that's the whole goal in using this type of framework is to automate all different type of devices and systems so that way we can streamline and cut back on the manpower that we need to manage in a very large enterprise or data center environment. So touching in back into the questions, it asks you, what should we, why should we use Ansible in network automation? And really, and, and you can think it, of it from a networking standpoint or even a security standpoint, right? It's a way that we can simplify the process for the ongoing business logic uh, to, I'm sorry, to automate network commands across different devices for administration purposes. So we can automate the task instead because if you're looking at like a Cisco switch, right? And if you want to <clears throat> configure that switch or if you want to set up something on that switch, to do something like for voice over IP or, you know, to set up some VLAN information on that switch. What you need to do is you have to wait for each of the command as you go through the CLI, the command line interface. And it's gonna ask you things like, you know, you have to enable it. You saw that I illustrate that last time you have to put in you know, your authentication information, you have to put input some information that would relate to that switch like IP address or the type of services like protocols that you would use on that device. So what we can do is we can create the appropriate files in the playbook in Ansible and we can do many of, we can set it up for many of the devices at once. I'm talking hundreds and thousands, right? And that's because who's gonna have time to sit at every single appliance and be able to configure that manually, right? If you look at the data center like Facebook, when they manage those type of data center, you would use hundreds and thousands of systems. So, and the technician will only have a certain amount of time to work with specific systems. So time is money and you know, you cannot have system that will go down, right? Uh, so this allow us to really simplify the process for the business, right? To really automate and that would reduce the manpower and the effort that you need. Uh, so in the long run, if you look at, you know, if you get into this field and, you know, whether you get into development side of the house or you get into the networking or the IT side of the house, you're still gonna to have to understand, right? How these APIs are being used and, and what can we do to automate this? Maybe you would expand on that and be able to write additional applications that would be helpful in the automation process or to cut back multiple steps, right? If we can reduce six steps, right? We can reduce time and that will cut costs. Any question with number one? You can find it on the first page of your notes. The second question we sort of addressed earlier, it asked you about if you can use Windows system to control hosts when implementing Ansible and the answer is no. Okay. And um, the control node must be running Linux operating system. And if you look into the installation of Ansible, it talks about what type of operating system that it would be uh, compatible with. And Ubuntu is there. I think if you use other releases of Linux, you should look at the documentation and see if it's compatible with Ansible or if, if you can install it on, your, on that release. So I put down that you should see the documentation. But if we're using Windows system in our network environment, like for servers and for our client machines, 
then we can use it as an, a, a host that will be controlled by the Linux node. This is considered as a target node. And when you run, when you use Ansible module with those targeted system, you need to implement it with the Windows PowerShell for the script. Okay, so I wanted to be very clear about that. Okay, so let's say that we need to patch, we need to run updates, right? On for, let's say drivers for a thousand Windows 10 machines. Who's gonna have time to run around and click, you know, different steps to do the installation for these machines, right? Um, what you can do is you can set up a Linux control node, and then you would be able to use Ansible to really automate the, the process, the steps in to, to be able to install the updates for the driver in this process. Okay, so that kind of give you an example of how you would use Ansible and in the case what we talk about is Windows target nodes. Any questions so far? Okay. And you can find, again, this information on the first part of your notes. All right, next we're gonna talk about how we would install Ansible and we're gonna attempt this with the lab this week, okay? Now, if you're using GSN3, if you successfully set that up with your appliances, then you would go to the automation system that you add, that's the PC, right, icon one, and then you would use the command line of that. And that one is running Linux. So you need to install Ansible on that one, along with a couple of other things that we're gonna talk about next. And then from there, you would be able, if you create a file, you can create a file and then be able to set up the inventory file in the playbook. And that way you can automate some of the things, things like, you know, SSH connecting in and then be able to change the IP address or set up an IP address or something like that. That will be easy. Okay. So for this week, we are going to use Ubuntu like what we've seen before. I saw that some of you successfully set that up. But if you're using your Raspberry Pi, you can also do that as well as it runs Linux and it uses a DB in Linux. So very close to what you've seen with Ubuntu. All right. Um, for the next question, we're gonna go back to the notes here. And once it talks about the control node installation, so for the control node, that Linux machine, you have to first install Ansible and there are a couple of steps. So in Linux system, any time that you are installing any tools or software, you should always update, okay? Because there are different versions and releases for different versions of Linux. And we wanna make sure that it's supportive of the version that you're currently using. So the first line that you see here is allowing you to update the system itself. And that might take a few minutes. It also depends on you know, network connection, et cetera. And after that, you are going to install what we would see as the software proper, the common software properties. And it uses this with, with the files that's going to be pulled from the repository for, for the um, Ansible. So there's a question asked, is Ansible a different way to configure networks? Yes, 
and it allows us to speed up the process in configuring switches or routers or servers or systems in general. It can also help us with streamlining tasks in, in network maintenance or system maintenance. So for example, like running backups, um, you know, installation of certain software, installation of files, um, you know, any tasks that you would think of, you should be able to automate that using a framework like this. And Ansible is known for framework that is related to network equipment, but you have other options in other frameworks as well. Okay, all right. So Packet Tracer is only a software that would allow you to simulate a network. Um, GSN3 is the alternate option or Cisco VIRL or I call it viral, right? Um, but you Packet Tracer is simply just for practice purposes. It is not used to, you know, it's a simulator. Right. Um, so I, you know, if you use that, it just gives you a bigger picture on what you would need to do. So in a real world environment, we would use real appliances and real system where packet tracer or GSN3 would not be of use. Uh, those would only be used for simulation for testing purposes. And, and so you would have to actually execute these things right, run these files on real systems, like in PowerShell of the real Windows server, or, you know, the Linux machines or switches and routers, okay. So Packet Tracer has been around for a long time, and the equivalent of that would be your GSN3 or Cisco VIRL, okay. All right, so for the installation, you want to check out the installation guide. I put the link there for you. But to answer the next question, question three, I broke it down into multiple steps. So the first step is that we need to update the system. So for Ubuntu, we would do a sudo app update. And sudo is for super user do, right? We don't log into root, we log into the power user that you created or the user that you created on that Linux machine. And then you would install the software property, the common software properties and add GitHub repo. So you would run those two commands, sudo app get install software properties common press enter, and then you would do a sudo app add re repo, and you need to point to where that repo would be, that will be Ansible. After you successfully complete those two commands, then you would lastly install Ansible by doing sudo app get install Ansible. Okay. <clears throat> So this is a framework that allows us to write or to create playbook that automate tasks for our systems, okay? Tasks that you would normally need in a network environment from daily tasks to once in a while tasks like periodic tasks. So for example, you might do periodic backup, right? Once a week or every other day, or you might run periodic updates. Or sometime you have to launch a certain application on a regular basis or install drivers for the user up on login, et cetera, um, then you can use a framework 
to automate some of your tasks. And this one is known for network appliances and servers. Any question with three? So the assignments is aimed to be very clear about how, how what it is and what, how to use it. So that way, when we approach it in the next session, we're not going to be, it's, it won't be as difficult because if you don't know what it is or how, you know, how you would go about installing it, then it will be challenging. Okay. Okay. So once you, once you have an install, you should check out versions of the Ansible. And in the text, it talks about, yes, you can use different versions. As you know that the newer versions have newer features for the some of the later appliances compared to the older version, it might not have all the features for the later appliances. Like if you're talking, if you're talking about Nessus, uh, from Cisco or for Nessus OS. So you want to check out some of the later versions uh, that would be compact, that would be used for your later appliance. But here to verify, just very similar to how you would verify the software that's installed on the Linux system, you would type in Ansible and then dash dash version. And it should tell you the type of version that you're you, that you have installed. And with that, we would have a path, right, for the configuration file for that particular tool or application. So for the next question, question four, we would put down that you can check the version by using command line in the control node system. And we would just simply input Ansible dash dash version and then press enter. And I note that you want to use version 2.5 or later for network automation. So after you do the installation for Ansible, it's a good idea to check out, right? Because there might be administrator or technician or developer before you, and they have installed a different version. So we wanted to push the update and install some of the later versions. So as company would scale their network, right? to the need of operation. So they might purchase or acquire new appliances. For example, security appliances, right? For the need of the company or upgrade their systems because the lifespan of most network appliances and systems is approximately five to seven years at the most with regular use is actually less, okay? Now, if companies would use it until, you know, they die or they don't work anymore, of course. But for the companies that require security and maintenance and such, sometimes they would be forced to upgrade because, you know, for crypto to cryptography reasons or, you know, different type of network services, et cetera, or newer protocols, then we want it to automate this so that way we don't have to reconfigure many, many systems. <clears throat> Any question with this? All right, so let's talk about how to really set it up once we install. Okay, so before we go into number five, so after uh, it touches on how to look at different versions and then 
what would be how we we can have multiple versions of it. Um, to get Ansible to work accordingly, you have to set up what's called a playbook. Okay. And you would do that on the control Linux host. Okay. So once you install Ansible, then you would need to set up a playbook. And as you've seen <laughs> in the other exercises, starting with the, the first, the second lab that we did was on um, SSH, right? On authentication. And SSH allow us to remotely connect to the system. So when you're configuring servers and appliances, you mainly need to directly connect or remote connect to those systems. So I can, I can go to, well, in, in a server room, you would have a, a terminal, right? A computer that would be connecting to a rack and you can use it to communicate with the network appliance. And that will be a direct connection. It would have a cable that would run to the switch or the router. And in a Cisco case, you would use their own cable because it's only made for their appliances. Um, and or if you connect to the server, you would connect it with an Ethernet cable through a switch and that switch connects to a server and that switch and the servers is on the, the same rack or together with multiple racks. OK. Now, from remote administration standpoint, you're not going to be there at 1 a.m. in the morning, right? Um, and most of the time, IT works during off hours for operations, so that way we can do maintenance and, and uh, tasks and things like that. So you need to terminal use SSH to connect to that system remotely, or in the case if you need to connect to Windows system with, from another Windows system, you just use RDP. So there are only two protocols that we mainly use to direct to remotely connect. SSH for Linux based systems and RDP for Windows based systems. Okay. So with this, we need to make sure that we SSH in and because it's going to be a key base, it uses PKI. So we need to, to make sure that the key is authorized for the connection to that system or that appliance. The second things that we need to do for our playbook is to create an inventory file. And what this file consists of is your appliance information. Remember, we are having inventory file to contain information about diff different network appliances, such as a Cisco router or a switch or a server right and that could be from different vendor but in that file it would be it would relate to the command that you would see on the api end, and we would see this later on for that particular vendor okay so you know that the big the the big people that that sells network appliances are cisco juniper and arista we talked about that last time and you know that you should know that they all have slightly different commands and interface, okay? So this inventory file allows us to keep inventory of different type of systems that we're working with. And we would utilize this in the playbook because that way it would understand what type of system that it's, it needs to communicate certain type of command to, right? So for example, when it's a username for Cisco, it would say, oh, it, we, we can plug in the user account that we created in our script and password, et cetera, right? IP address in lowercase, um, stuff like that. So the inventory file allows us to really specify the vendor specific information. And then the playbook itself is gonna be the set, the task that's gonna be executing that we wanted to do, 
right? The things that we wanted to do to that appliance or a group of, of systems on our network, okay? So once it's execute, we should test it though, right? Like before you roll live, you should always test it. And going back to the earlier question, yes, we can use a simulator to test it. If you don't, you can't take the appliance offline. Um, you know, if you have a secondary appliance, you would test it there, but we would use a simulator and virtual machine to test this. So that way, you know, in the case if there's something go wrong, we can fix it before we actually launch the script and take down the whole network if something goes wrong. Okay, so there are four things that are required um, to really set up the, the, the playbook. And it goes into the PKI public key infrastructure. This would relate to the rules, right? For the, the policies and the role for that, that particular point. So what I mean role is if you're looking at like, let's say you, you guys are familiar with web servers, okay? So web servers are connected to a domain and sometimes it is also connected to a subdomain in that network, right? So for example, you might have facebook.com and Facebook also own Instagram, but the parent domain is really facebook.com, right? And they migrate, they connect Instagram to Facebook or other things that Facebook offer, right? As web services. So with that, the child systems or the subsystems actually has like different set of rules in what it can and cannot do based on the child role. So with that, we have to really understand that this key really pertains to the role and the specific privilege for that system in a network environment. Not all switches have the same uh, capability in a network. Some switch is handling certain part of the, the network or only work with a certain subnet. And then other switches are in a higher level where it would, it would be able to handle additional privilege and in a larger scale of the network, okay? So understanding that is gonna help you visualize how this key is being implemented um, across these systems. So we wanted to make sure that we would have a key and that key would allow us to control the system the way that we want, okay? And it would require you to set up the authentication to, and then once that key is used, it would turn off the authentication process, just very much like what you've seen when you ran the, the uh, pexpect script, once you ran it, on that virtual machine, you no longer require to authenticate because it stores that key and it understands that that key is already is in place. It has a trust. It established a trust between one system to another, right? And this is the way most all security appliances work, right? On, on or network appliances work with, with the security level is that it's like how you have a family member and you give the key to them to your house, right? Once that person has the key, this person can come and go because you trust them, right? And it's very much like that. We establish that key with authentication. Once it's stored, then you, you will not be required. Now it says that you will now be able to SSH and connect to the control mode to the remote node using the private key without having to be prompted the password again. So that trust is established between the control node and the target node one that, once that key is established. So if I'm connecting to a server and I establish that key, right? I will not need to know the password to re-enter it again, right? For the, the session, because I am now using a trusted system that's gonna be communicating with the server system. Okay, any question with that? Okay, let's touch on inventory file. So as we mentioned a little bit before, right? Inventory file is 
we need to specify what which system is our target system. Okay. And we can simply create it as a plain text. And later on, we'll talk about how that would be with YAML. Um, so by default, if, if you look at this example, what they're using is they're using IP address or domain name frequently. So this is the, the FQDN, which is domain name like google.com, uh, microsoft.com, uh, you know, mvc.edu, stuff like that. So you can use it with the domain name or you can use it with an IP address. And basically that is a way to really identify, right, which domain is that system exists in. And next, we would then use that IP or the domain to try to reach it, right? So the example that they show here is to use the IP address of the machine <clears throat> to be able to reach the control host. And in the command line, this is what it would look like, okay? So now the way that they use this for is to ping, right? Ping command is used in all network systems to do what? To check if the system is connected or alive and it uses ICMP. So I can simply ping a server to see if it's responding. If it's replying to me, that means that it is connected, right? It is alive, it, it's, re, it's accepting requests. Um, and this is a way that we can also use to troubleshoot our network. So for example, like you wanted to, to ping let's say 500 computers to see if they are properly configured and networked, you can do that too, right? By creating the playbook and automate that process. So you don't have to sit there and type in ping and with the option for count and for every single system. And that's the whole point. Okay. So now we wanted to make sure that we would set up the playbook and the playbook would be used as the same user on the remote host. So what it does is it takes your, your credential and it would implement that using the framework through Ansible on the targeted system. So if you execute it as a different user, then you have to specify which user that is and assuming that that user already has the, the, the authentication key, okay, the PKI. Otherwise, the private key. Otherwise, it's, you know, it would not be able to let you connect as a different user. So normally we would have like, you know, we don't use administrator or root. So we would have a user that we would create or a group of users that we would use for administration purposes for, you know, um, and then you would authenticate with that user, obtain the key and be able to control the other system through that user account. Any question? So if you were um, uh, executing mm -hmm. and you're supposed to be on the uh, remote host and you were doing it for like, you know, thousand, computers, how would you put yourself in all the remote hosts? So first, you would set up the control systems and then write your playbook, okay? And then depending on the remote host, if your remote host is Windows, then you would connect to the PowerShell or tell it to you to connect to the PowerShell. And the process within that has to be written in, in Python and included in the tasks of the playbook. So you have to really look at each process, right? Like, like when I cannot just run any script on Windows system without being an administrator. So at some point or another, I would have to open PowerShell as an administrator account. 
you know, you do the run as administrator. So that process has to be incorporated with the script itself. Like you would have to say that you do run as administrator and then, you know, it would revert back to the key. If that key is at administrator level, then it's going to allow you to, it's going to open up the, the, the PowerShell and then you just drop the file or you run, you run the, the, the script in, inside that shell and you automate that through the task. You will see, I will show you how the task would look like, but. Um, Sorry, in, indirect question. Um, do you have to run GNS3 as an administrator? Uh, to test it? Yes. Okay. So on the GNS3, you would, the account that you logged on is actually, I think it's, it's either super user or at the root level already. So on the remote system on the GNS3, but you will usually the secondary account that they normally create for this is a super user account for administration purposes. And then there are slight difference between the root and the super user account right, as far as the privilege goes. But most of the things you can do, you can do on super user, okay? All right, so what is really a playbook? It is a blueprint that would describe what you would like to do to the host. Like what I mentioned before, I wanna install, I wanna install drivers on all the systems. I want to run backup. I want to sync the database servers. I want to set up IP addresses for all the new computers that are connected um, to make it all static IP. So there are endless number of things that we can do to the host depending on what we need, right? So it is basically, we, they call it a playbook. It's really a list of tasks that we wanted to do to the target host, okay? All right, so let's answer the next question, number five. So what is the playbook in a control node and how do you set it up? And we can say that the playbook contains the blueprint of controls just say for the host or the blueprint of controls of the host. So what do you want to control on that host, that target, right? It consists of SSH key authorization to access host and inventory file of host details like IP address, command base information. And the way the playbook is used is it's formatted with YAML, which is readable to us. So to kind of show you what that looks like, let me open a file here. Okay, um, so it looks like this. Okay, and if you have the text, you can also take a look at his examples for Cisco and Juniper and Arista. Question? So you don't have to be in one of the um, pseudo, pseudo files to be allowed as a host. You could just have the SSH key. Yes. You only need that at the beginning when you establish the key. Once you establish the key for that user account that you're using to control the host, then that's it, right? The key is stored, so you don't, you don't need additional. What if you no longer want that someone else have access to that key? How would you go about changing the key? So. There are two ways in that. We can revoke the account, right? With, with, in which it will revoke the key. So um, you can remove 
that key because that key is stored and it's stored in a, a, in a certain directory. So you can remove that key or revoke that key. Now, if you use the key distribution center server, then you have to do it on the server. But in this case, the way that it's illustrated in this text and also in his example is really like a, a system to system, right? It's not being distributed in a hierarchical environment. So in some network, you would have a server that's managing all the keys, um, you know, for everything, okay? And, and they wanted to centralize that because you could be managing many different sites and many different administrators and, and so forth. So in that case, then you would have to go into the server system and revoke the key or, or change the account, uh, the settings for that particular SSH that you don't, let's say the, that person quit or, or whatnot, then you would change the account information for that key. And um, that would require the, the new administrator to authenticate to be able to establish the second key. So I would issue a different key for the second administrator and then stop the key from being distributed for the old administrator. Uh, so that's another way that you could do it, but simply you just disable or delete the key that would just require authentication at every time that they SSH, okay? So if you want them to authenticate every time, then you take away the key. Okay, any questions? And you can put, you can put, See, the way that most of the default settings is that it assumes that, you know, it's for the session, but you can also put like, uh, you can put expiration on stuff and all the keys is built out of certificate. So if you create certificate that has an expiration, you can tie that with the key and all cryptography uses it, when it's key based, it, it, it implements certificate and you can you can also control certificate and how the keys distribute it. So there are many levels behind that. And we can probably look further um, in the security class if, if you want. So this class is a little bit different than what you've seen in the regular Python class. And because the purpose for this class is to really understand how Python can be used in network environment or for automation purposes, right? Okay, any question with five before we go further? Okay, so this one is lengthy. You don't have to put everything that I put, but I want it to be detail oriented so you can understand it, but you can find this information on in the next part. So let's go back to the notes. Um, here, it gives you the example of how the playbook would look like, right? So this is the host that we're connecting to. And you saw that from earlier, right? Um, and uh, the task that they're doing here is to check this usage, okay? Part of the inventory process in the network environment is to check to see if how much of the disk is used. Uh, in, in the case where we don't want the user to store you know, a lot of their files locally, right? Or if we can also check if this is like a network attached storage system, we can check to see if we're maxing out on our hard drive or, you know, do we need additional drive? We can also check for backup reasons. So this particular example is to look at this host and the task that it's doing is to, to check the disk usage. And the way that we would run this is we would have a file that would be launched for shell. And in Windows, we just simply use PowerShell. In Linux, we would just use regular shell. So we can run it. And with that, it would give you some kind of response, right? If it's connected, it will tell you it's connected. And then we want to also have it output something. Okay, so later on in, in some of the later uh, uh, snapshot that you would see, you, we would be able to output some kind of details about that system. So questions? 
All right. So here you have, um, and he mentioned that he uses the option I for the host. And so when you run it, you would you would play and this is the system, this is your target, right? The task, we specific tasks that you specify. So we can do a setup. And then once it goes, it's gonna tell you it's okay. And then we would run another task with it, like check this usage, okay? And then we can run many different tasks. So if it's changed, then it's gonna tell you which system is changed. And if, if it's not reachable, that if it's not connected or when it's failed, it's gonna tell you the other two parameters there. So um, this is kind of like the, so after with the shell module, after you, you, you run this file, it's gonna issue the commands, right, for that system to execute certain tasks. So basically when we're automating, what do we really do? We actually just pre-fill out all the command stuff and then launch it all at once so we don't have to wait, type in the answer, wait, type in another command and then type in the answer. So it, it just simplify our lives, right? So that's what the playbook really is, is just to pre-fill out, pre-filled information to, you know, for certain tasks or to execute certain command. Because if you use the interface and you click something, that's issuing a command. And with that command, right, if you need to fill out information in a certain field, then you can automate that task with the playbook. All right, questions? All right, advantages, you can find advantages on page five and forward. So along with Ansible, uh, there is Chef, Puppet, and Salt Stack, okay? There are a lot of resources on some of these. If you look online, you know, including on uh, DevNet with Cisco, you would find like Puppet, or um, if you look online, there are tutorials for a lot of these. Ansible is also one of them. So there are many infrastructure for frameworks, right? Uh, so there are different type of frameworks. And the benefit of using Ansible is that it is agentless. You don't need any kind of additional software that needs to be installed on the target system, on the client system to talk back to the server. So, um, you know, outside of the, the interpreter for Python, you don't need additional software at all. And that kind of minimize additional, you know, resource requirement and things. Because imagine if you have to install software on the client machines, that's just another task on its own, right? The whole point is to simplify as much as possible. So it is agentless. And with SSH, you're able to remotely connect to the target system. So it uses SSH for or API calls to change or in case you need to reconfigure that host or execute the task on that host. It also has an identpotence, which is that it is a property for operations in mathematics or computer science that can be applied to uh, multiple lines without changing the result. So you saw this in the first lab. After you run the script for using pexpect, right? You notice that when you run it again, it's gonna give you an error because it already established the, the SSH connection, right? There's nothing else for it to do. So in the case where when, when we were using Paramico or pexpect in our script, every time that you run it, right, it creates an instance, okay? And in some cases for our network environment, when you recreate the instance 10 times, it changes your system 10 times. In, in some case, it depends on the script. Well, on this one, when you rerun it, you can run it as many times as you, you want 
it would not change it would not change uh, the actual system as it already exists. Okay, so the changes won't be applied after the first run because we it would be able to know that after that the configuration change is not needed. Okay, so we had talked about how we don't need its agentless. Okay, so you can say that this would be agentless. And that kind of tie into both of these points. We can say that it has identifiers. And it's also simple. So the benefit of it is that it is versatile and simple. That you can write it in Python and use YAML for the playbook language, which is relatively easy. Now for Cisco, uh, because it's using YAML and Python, it's basically, uh, they are both widely used languages. And it's, when you look at YAML file, it's gonna be very close to Python syntax. So you can probably figure out a lot of it by just simply looking at it without going in depth with the documentation. So the template engine that it uses is called Jinja2. And this is a common tool that's used with Python web frameworks such as Django or Flask. Okay. And so the knowledge is transferable. And the last area is for uh, network vendor support. And because it is very well supported by vendor, that new uh, appliances and tools from vendor are usually incorporated with Ansible mostly. Okay. And then the community is very, um, I guess, open to suggestions and things like that for change. So the, what you see is, I guess, Ansible is well adapted in a lot of net, different network administration tasks. So we we highlighted that there is it is agentless. It has an idempotence. It is simple and versatile, and it is well supported with network vendors. And I'm talking about like Cisco, Juniper, Avista, Fortranet. Uh, you know, there are lots and lots of new vendors that would be considered as major players in network environment. So the way that Cisco set it up is when you go from iOS to NXOS, they're not a huge major change, especially if you want to implement commands, right? So what they did was the iOS is the old operating system that they have used and they still use it for some of the existing appliances, okay? They implemented the later operating system with the API uh, for things like Nessus and some of the later series. But when they transition from the old 
operating system interface to the new operating system interface, they kept a lot of the things the same. So when you're working with an older Cisco appliance and a newer Cisco appliance, there's not a huge discrepancy, especially when you want to implement Ansible to automate the, the configuration tasks behind it, okay? So vendor, they have considered that, you know, and also if you introduce a whole new different set of commands and interface, you got to retrain all of this administrator and likely that they will lose the business. People won't buy new appliances if they're not familiar with the interface or how to control it. Um, so they try to keep it as close as possible. And you see that across the board, right? Uh, the one vendor that you would see that would have some drastic change would be more on the software side like Microsoft. Uh, so when you're looking at servers, but they might change the menu, but the functionality and the operation, the process still remains the same in the back. So when you're looking at like configuration, they might change the wizard or the drop down menu options but the, the same roles, the same tasks is still happening with the same system, the same type of, of server role. So, so considering that um, you would see this a little bit more frequent with the type of common network vendors that, that's out in the market, okay? Any questions with the advantages before we go further? Okay. So here um, I give you different sections and what I did was I just took out various sections starting on page five going to like page seven. It talks about um, on page six, simple and extensible network vendor support. and then going into Ansible architecture. So earlier we mentioned that these are all the components that are in the architecture, right? We have to have, uh, we have to have uh, the format, which is YAML. We have to have inventory file. And YAML is a format that would be used in uh, Ansible in Express Playbook and variables. This is how we would use to declare, this is the format that we would use to declare the variables for Ansible. And the variables later on, we'll touch on that, right? Uh, but here, the variables are uh, specific to host name, IP, um, how that would relate to the neighbor because the router actually, it sees its neighbor. And variable allows you to have a set of plays that would be accommodating with the differences. So basically you create a label or an identifier that would be carried across, right? Many different types of appliance. So for example, um, in my network, I might have like three different types of routers, right? A Cisco router. And then later on, somebody bought another brand router uh, like Juniper. Um, Etc. Right. So what I can do is I can incorporate variables, and that would allow we would be able to use it across three different devices when we run that script. But we have to really consider right what kind of commands that each of the devices when we create that script using Ansible. Okay. And it incorporates templates. So templates allow us to really reduce the effort and the amount of work that we need. So the example here talks about how we um, would replace the host name and, and Ansible allows us to use the standardized template that's formatted in Jinja 2 to really set that up. So it's already been created for you. You just use the template to kind of fill out the information and be able to, to 
you know, implement it instead of starting from scratch. Okay, so YAML. This is used for Ansible Playbook. And you can refer to the documentation for syntax. But to start a file, you would use three dashes. White space indentation is used to denote structure in the line very much like Python. You know how you indent for the code block, right? Under like a control statement or for a loop. Exactly that you need to indent to denote structure. You would use the hash sign to comment. And you can implement list and the list members are denoted with a hyphen. And you can have one member per line. I forgot to add this. List can also is used very much like Python. It uses square brackets. And you would use a comma as a separator. Dictionary is very much like Python. It uses a key with the value pairs and you would separate that using a colon, same as Python. You can enclose the dictionary inside the curly braces and you can separate each element of the dictionary by a comma. The string, you don't have to use quotation mark, but you can. You can enclose it in a single or double quotation mark. So the slight difference is in that Python require at least a single or double for string quotation marks. So in YAML, the strings, you don't have to enclose it in quotation marks. And it would map well with JSON or Python data types. So the example that you would see here, right? So this is a dictionary. You see name and then shell. Okay, and then we would have a string called host and then the IP address as a string there. So to answer the next question, number seven, you would denote the start of the file using three dashes. And then you would use, you can use a single double quotation mark for string or not use quotation mark at all. So if you wanted to keep it the same as Python, right, we can use the single or double quotation mark to indicate. So very close to Python. When we're looking at syntax from YAML. Any question with seven? So here's a file. This is the example that the author provides. We have this is to indicate the beginning of the file. Okay. And then we can, <clears throat> we can specify. So our host, this is going to be the name of the host. And then when we use the hyphen, remember, it talks about the hyphen. In that when you use a hyphen at the beginning there, that's going to be just saying that it is part of a list. So when you look at this file, this is just saying that these are list members. And then here, we're going to get into variables now, but here is the variable vars. And then with that, we would enclose that when we do the, de the variable definition, we would use the curly brace like this. Okay. So for the task, if you look further in the task, this is where we would identify the commands. OK. 
Okay. And then we would reference the variable definition. Okay. So let's touch on variable now so you can understand it further. So earlier we talked about inventory and inventory is stored here. Um, real quick for the, the square bracket here, this is gonna be the group names, okay? So you can reference the group in your playbook. Okay, so I might have like a group called Windows 10 or I might have a group like Nessus is for the Nessus switch. I might have a group for all my Linux machines or servers. So what you can do is you can build in a list that would include, right, all the systems under that group. And a group can nest within another group. So what you would see is that you might have like, let's say a switch that's nested within another group, you know, that's called something else, but you have to list the, all the members in that group. Okay. So within this right here, we use vars that was declared and defined in the other file. So at this point, what it's gonna do is it's gonna pull the information for that variable, okay, from the YAML file. So the way that we would set up the inventory is we would say what group, what system is in each group, okay? And then how we would use that group. Any question regarding inventory? All right, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about variable. So variable allows us to accommodate different appliances, okay? And variable, just like how you would declare a variable in a regular program or script, you can use letters, numbers. Uh, you wanna start out with letters and you can also use underscore. You should always start out with the letter when you name your variable. It is defined in three locations, in the playbook, in the inventory file, and if you need to, you can have it separated in the files that would include with the roles. Okay, so for security reasons, we would have to create a separated, a separate files pertaining to rules and things that we need to implement. But in general, you would have the, the variable specified in these areas. Okay. So here is where, this is the example that the author used to show you how to define the variable. So we would reference it. So what you have is you have vars here, okay? And with the double curly brace, which is a reference of how that variable would be used, reference that variable. So here we would reference it and that would go to the other file that we also use the, we would specify what VARS is there too. <coughs> so what it's gonna do is it's gonna plug in this, right, for the host. Okay, and then again here, you see it with the CLI, that means it's gonna launch the command line there from the, for that provider. Cause at this one with the NXOS, right? 
If it's connected, then it's going to open command line interface. And then it's going to issue the command call output. And, and to so it's going to use show output. And then it's going to be able to, to display the information after it's connected and show output. All right, so let's answer the next question. Variables are found in playbook, in inventory file, or in separate files that would include in files and rules. And you would reference a variable in the playbook for question nine. You can use Jinja 2 templating system convention, which uses the double curly bracket. So you just need to enclose it into the double curly bracket, which is a Jinja 2 template format. Question. Now using this, you don't have to test it with, like the, like I said, you don't have to test it with network appliances or you know even simulator for networks, okay? You can think about testing it with different type of system, even with different virtual machines, depending on what you want it to do. Okay. So before we get into the Jinja 2, let's touch on some of the things here. So here on page nine, it gives you the example of how variable is used and how to reference a variable. So as you've seen that we would use CLI here, that's a reference of the variable. It, this is because it's not in the playbook, but it is in a, the other files, like in the inventory file. Okay, so you would you would reference that by using the double curly brace. Okay, so this explains a little bit about how that was used to reference IP address or DNS. in the earlier part of the example. To declare variable in the inventory file, okay, you would set it up like this. So we would, we would need to use the variable in the inventory file instead of declaring in the playbook. So you have to declare the variable in an inventory file and then reference it in the playbook. Think of it like how at the end of last semester we were using module, right? We would we would use a module and then we, we can import in um, a function or a method from that module. Okay, so what we can do is we can write like an inventory file where we would declare the variable and then or a group of variables and then we can use it in the playbook by referencing it. Okay. So here you have a group. Okay, of systems like switch one and switch two. 
and it's under Nessus by name. So then in, so if you add Nessus by name to the host file, then you can have it like this, Nessus by name colon vars. So here it gives you three things, right? This is the, the playbook area. Okay, so here under task, we would have it where we would reference the variable. And then this is how it's declared. Vars, CLI, what it is in the inventory. Okay. And then this is how it would also be used with the system if we manually set it up. So what we see is for the name, right? We tell it configure SME contact host Nessus by name. And earlier you saw that we can establish that when we create the inventory file, we would set it up. This is a string for the host, right? And then it's gonna fill that in. So these are the example and it explains what each of the example really means. And this would be something for the output from the playbook. Okay. Any question with this? So for Jinja 2, this is a template engine that was created by the Python community. It is used for web frameworks such as Django and Flask. So if you wanted to implement, if you wanted to use Python with web development, you will learn about Django and Flask and, and other frameworks. So, um, you know, this is a common template engine that you would see, not just for networking, but for other programming purposes as well. Okay, so here provides you with information about Jinja 2. Jinja 2. Uh, so Django and Flask are used for web frameworks and Jinja 2 is just a template engine for Ansible and Ansible is the framework for network devices. So this is an element of our, the framework that we're using, but it's also is a template that can be used with Django and Flask. Okay. So Jinja is not the same as Django and Flask, but it is a template engine for those two as well, along with Ansible. Other questions? That's probably why you don't see books on Jinja too whereas you see books on Django and Flask. Yes. And I think you can find their documentation and read up on that. Um, I don't think, yeah, so because of, of how it's used, but yeah, Django and, and Flask is very common with web development. Okay, so if you're looking for like web development jobs, you would see like, especially with Python, you would see that those are the listed ones. Uh, Dr. Wynn? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just having a little, uh, um, well, so why do we need uh, these templates? So that way we don't have to figure out what kind of information we need to put in. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so think right. of it like 
think of it like um think of it like a mold right to something right we can fill in everything that's already preset so but it's just really established a structure for us because if you're looking at thousands of different vendor right and it kind of mm -hmm. standardized the process for us for most part from from a vendor standpoint or from the administrator standpoint yeah so we don't have to start from scratch there it's helpful. Oh. and can you use ginger um with other programs Frameworks? Yeah. yeah so oh. you can use it with so if you like it as mentioned right you can use it i think you can also use it with django flask also puppet but depending on the framework so the best way to really is to look at the framework documentation and it will tell you what kind of template engine that's supported for that framework. And, you know, this is a common one for these, mm -hmm. but it might support other templates as well. Oh, okay. okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, for next part, we're going to talk about there's only a couple more things that we need to address, but Next thing we're going to talk about is here you can find information about Ginger 2 and you can go to the link if you wanted to look at the information about the template engine for and it was built from Python community so. Um, and so we, we need to talk about networking modules. So Ansible modules are Python code it's built from Python and it allows you to execute that for the target host. We, we touch on that at the beginning. But most equipment, you need to know that it will not respond to Python automatically, okay? So as you saw that some of the later series for Cisco, they implemented the API that works with Python, but not all vendors supports this, right? So, it doesn't contain Python within the actual host or the device itself. So you should use a playbook, right, to control those nodes. Meaning that, you know, so like at the beginning, we talked about, oh, you can run this script and that script using p expect and paramico, and you can run it on the network appliances, but not all network appliances understand Python, right? as they were built differently. Um, so a, an easier way to centralize the control is to use your, your playbook that you would create in Ansible using Ansible and then run that, okay? So that way it's instead of interpreting it directly to that system, it already having built-in commands that would be able to launch for that system so that system doesn't need to interpret the python script okay so what it's saying here is that we are always executing the playbook locally on the control node so the playbook interpret the commands and sends those commands to the actual target node and that's what we're doing okay now you can attempt the Python script directly onto the target node if it's supportive of Python. But if it doesn't, you have to use a framework to launch the commands for that target node. Okay. Any question with that? That's important to point out because, you know, I know that you're going to write your script down in this course and down the line let's say that you work in it or in development and you wanted to test things right don't be surprised that you, you see systems that will not have be able to interpret python so then you would use a framework okay so let's talk about uh arguments that that would be the things that we need to fill in right that's the whole point to the, the, the input information that we need for different types of systems. And they could be different from one vendor to another, but for most part, the vendors, they're pretty 
good at keeping the things similar or very close, okay? So some of the basic that will translate across all network appliances, host, okay? That will be your, the name of the remote host, okay? Port, this defines the port, which is a, a number that's assigned to that physical connection, right? Like we say, SSH uses port 22 for TCP or, you know, HTTP uses port 80, right? So when you tell it port, it would understand what that is. Basically, it is defined as a connection value, okay? Username for the user authenticated, password, password, or passphrase. That would be for user authenticated. Transport means connection, okay? The type of connection, like, and that would pertain to some protocol, okay? Whether it's connection-oriented or connection-less oriented, but there are various protocol that would be for transport. Um, authorize, that would be for privilege or, you know, what's allowed for that device, okay? So this enables the privilege escalation for the device that require it. So when we, when, when, when we issue authorize and some information about authorize, what is it allowed to do? And then auth pass is basically for privilege escalation for passwords. So with that, it might require additional uh, verification for that credential, okay? So this is basically commonly found across different vendors for arguments, okay? And you can also refer to the documentation if you're working with iOS or with with you know, Nessus or with Jupyter or with Arista. So they are pretty good at specifying what kind of argument for specific systems that are commonly found that is. Okay. So here is the example in the complete length. This is the YAML file, okay? Notice that this is where you declare your, this is your inventory. This is where you declare some of the stuff. So notice that the arguments that you have, right? So here we have host and we would plug, we would reference the variable that was, you know, that would be Ansible host, username, username, password. Okay, and then on the playbook, even though it shows failed here because it's not connected, then what the, it would do is it would execute the task. Okay. So here it touches on how the API looks similar between iOS and NXOS. And then I also just, I didn't include all the example for both because it will just be just screenshot. If you have the text, you can take a look at it, but we'll take a look more at the example when we're working with the lab. Um, for the Ansible for Jupyter, or Juniper, I'm sorry, Juniper, you need to use PyEasy and NetConf. So with that, you also need to install JXM lease, which is required for Juniper. Okay, so that's just a different brand of network equipment. And then Arista, it's used command line interface or EAPI interface, which is a little bit different to configure in the transport. But for most part, your argument would be the same. So to answer the next question, what is the purpose of provider argument in Ansible? It 
is to specify the provider transport, which is unique to the command used for the device. Let me move 11 down to the next one so you can see it together. And then lastly, for number 12, the difference and the similarities in creating iOS and NXOS playbooks. The syntax, you can put down that the syntax for the modules are this in the same pattern. The only difference is that the argument of the modules would be different as they use slightly different commands. The iOS version of the devices are older. So there's, it doesn't understand API. So when you work with the older Cisco equipment, you're using older iOS version, excuse me, which doesn't use API. And then Ansible have a reference for best practices. So you can refer to that if you're not sure. Okay, so the later OS for Cisco, you would see it has API, which goes back to our last chapter. And it talks about how we can use like NX OS and, and so forth. Okay, so keep in mind that when you write playbook for Cisco devices, there are differences across their OSs. And well, when we're not sure, we just wanted to look at the guide and see what the community provided for us before we go to the vendor. Okay, so we cover concepts that would relate to Ansible today. We touch a little bit on what it kind of looked like. So for our session next time, we would write these files together. And then if you want to test it, I can illustrate on how you can test it with the virtual machine that you have, or if you have a Linux system that you can do that. And if you wanted to do it on GSN3 because it took you forever to set that up, that's fine too, but you need to run it on the automation um, node that you have there, okay? And it will require a little bit of system resource processor and RAM. Okay, but you can nest a virtual machine with that. And then in the meantime, I will look at options via cloud to see if we can SSH into like, you know, something on AWS or another provider that's free for you. And that way you can also have a third option on how you would test it there. Okay. Any question? So don't give up on this class. This class is a little bit different than your normal programming class, but it gives you a lot of details, especially if you know there's different areas that you can see the benefit from, from development and the programming and stuff like that. And if you are good at this on the resume, that's a plus because not a lot of people can do this. So not a lot of school teaches this either. So <laughs> any question for me? We're going to be down in size. I saw that a couple of students dropped this class already, um, possibly because of frustration with the lab. But as long as you understand how to write the script and how that script will work together in a network environment, I'm OK with it. OK. All right. No questions? Add your name to the chat. And um, I'll stick around for some questions in case you have questions. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. And I'll see you later this week. Thank you, Dr. Wen. So far, you're okay. welcome. Oh, sorry. Bye. Yes, Michelle. 
So for the GNS3, um, you recommended to use a different switch than the NS. Um, yeah, you can use the iOS one. It would just be a little different because iOS doesn't use API, but you can automate some stuff with it. Um, if you are able to find an image like that, the NX9000 would probably work well with that. But those those um, those images t need to be run on the, the GSN3 VM. Otherwise, it would not work. But you can oh, test no, I, it. I, I looked at the 9000 that requires 8 megabytes of RAM. Yeah. So yeah. I, uh, I don't know if I could just do a simple router connected to a switch. Yeah. Or is that? Yes. Oh, really? And then think, but what I want you to experience first is once you connect it before you start configuring it. Remember how I illustrate to go to enable and then to do config T or to do setup. If you issue setup, I think on the older one, it might be config T for the iOS then you can look at the process that's incorporated with that interface. And then you can think about how you can automate that, right? Because in, in writing the automation file, you have to understand like how it's gonna flow. Is it asking you, like it would ask you like, oh, you know, what's the IP address and how it asks you for that. Then what you need to do is you need to be able to say, okay, we would fill in this when we would see, we would do this task when it sees this. So when you ask for device settings, is that just like show version or show running config? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can, you can do like, you can do show and it will just show everything about that system. I think I'm pretty sure on Cisco. <coughs> iOS sometimes, you know, and then, um, so if you do show or show IP or something like that, it would show, right? So think about the process and the way that you can best examine it is to look at a CLI, right? Go into the configuration mode and see what's happening there. Just like what we did the first lab. In order to SSH in, we have to see how it's done. And what if once you have the process down, you can automate those the tasks. Okay. Okay. And then um, I noticed that uh, it, it um, you know, I, I mentioned in the email that I, I pressed the green button to start it. Yeah. And that's when I, I just cannot connect. And, um, you know, I just tried just doing the switch and the uh, NXOS. And without that the VM, right? No, without, no, in the VM, but without the NAT and without the um, network automation, and that still doesn't work. So I'm, I'm trying to troubleshoot. So what, what's going on there if it's just the switch and the NX and so it doesn't want to connect if, to the local host? If, if, if you're not connecting to the local host, that means your virtual machine configuration is funky. Like, so when you're running the application, you got to run the GNS VM at the same time. No, it will take a router and a switch. The yes. the router from the Dynamics. Oh, okay, so if if you if you do, but but once you set it the application with the VM, it's always gonna look for the VM, no matter what. Oh yeah. You understand what I mean? So uh, maybe I don't. So so okay. So the first when you install the the GNS three application, right? If you don't, if you tell it that it's gonna be for, it's gonna be to the local system that was part of the wizard, then it's not gonna look for that VM. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, that's in the setup. Um, I'm I'm like past yeah. that where I, I have it set up, and for some but, reason it doesn't like the network automation. Uh -huh. it, you know it, or it doesn't like the NX. But if I just do the simple switch and router, it'll it'll start those devices. Yes. But it won't start something more complicated. Right. But it, it won't because there's no VM for it. So, but when you, so like, let me, let me share a screen with you. And oh, I thought it was using the VM with the router and the switch. Oh, no. Yeah. So if it, because running the images for the other one, then yes, you have to run the VM. 
But in the preference, if you set it up to look for the VM, it's always going to notify you that localhost is not found because the server is off. But you can definitely run it and 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 still do a you know a low a, a very simple topology where you would have you would have like what I've showed you before. Hold on. I, I'm not sure what you why would the local server be off if um if I try to start all the devices. So let me show you here. Okay, so here's my application, right? I don't have my VM running. You see how it tells me that it's looking for my local host? Yes. Because it, it's gonna automatically launch the VM anyway. Yes. Right? Because I set right. it up that way, okay? But let's say that if I just wanted to do this as a test for, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna draw a topology, I'm gonna, create a topology that's not going to require this this thing because it's so I simply just let's say I drop in a an ethernet switch and then I drop in um, a PC and I'm not going to use the other one um, or the net cloud right um, this one is installed on that. So let's say that I do this and then I would put in another ATM switch, let's say, okay. And then I link them. Oh yeah, this one doesn't have a port for it. Let me see. Let me read to that. Now this one is an unmanaged switch. So you have to find a, like another appliance that has iOS or something. Okay. And then let's say that I link this. I, I brought this appliance in a while back for the router. Okay. Like this. Okay. Now, then we would then start and then we just go ahead and get started. So they all should be green. Now, if it shows red, look down here, it will tell you why that's red. Possibly that that interface, the physical connection to that device is not adaptable. To no, I usually it. have a, a timeout. Yeah. So if it's on timeout, possibly because of this. So when you're looking at, so if you wanted to use something like this, you can download some of the Dynamips and Dynamips is, you know, there are different Dynamips. Some of these support different type of protocols as it would be a little bit different than the NX. But um, yeah, so when it's timeout, that means that it's not able to establish stable connection using that cable, okay? So when you draw like this, the links, basically you take a cable and you connect, you simulate taking a cable connecting from one port to another port. And if it's sure. not able to support that cable, then the e whatever interface you tell it, then that means that it's not gonna work. Well, I... I I mean, why wouldn't the NX support that cable? I mean, I think that would, it would be able to support the cable. So let's say that I go from this, okay, to here, right? So now I can choose, okay. Now, if it's on and then sometimes it switch off is because something is funny with your server. So I would go into preferences. preferences. Yeah, and then I would check for that virtual machines. And yeah, also, I check the versions. 
I check version, the port. And then, and then the iOS. So you're using, um, what is that? When you brought it in, let me see. Here it gives, actually, if you put your cursor on it, it tells you uh, a little bit more about it. But at the same time, like on this guy right here, so it says link from switch one to ethernet. This is disabled. So on this guy, you also have to configure it logically because you got to enable like what that is you're connecting to because, and then you turn it on. What do you mean? In, I have to In the real it. world, in the real world, not the simulator. When no, you, I mean, by, I'm sorry, by CLI, I have to go first yeah. before I turn it on. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what we do in the real world because this is why packet tracer and these simulators don't make don't tie correlate too well because you can't just take a cable and connect things together and it would see what those are. Just think about it, right? Like if you have a brand new computer and you connecting to another device or install brand new hardware, you got to tell it what it is, configure the driver, you know, like a little bit about that hardware device. It's not going to automatically know these, these are very like, even though it's managed, it's not going to be as smart as the human. So no, I just assumed it would because it, it does that with the, the router and the NAT cloud. So right. Yeah. So yeah. now you understand that everything that we connect, like on this level, because it's not managed, like this is not managed and this is not managed, the router just route things out, right? The C3600. But on on this guy right here, because it has an operating system and it's gonna want to know what those are. And okay. is that the same with the network automation device? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So when, right. but, but at the same time, like also make sure that when you add in these appliances, make sure that you have both of the files that it's looking for the image file and that second file. So, um, when you oh, yeah, I it, can install it. I don't think I can install it without those two. Yeah. Files. I so. had the same problem with this one in that. I, I try to because it wants more RAM and I even like I, I'm on this on this computer, I'm running 16 gigs and I try to up it and inside the virtual machine itself and then try to change the image higher. It did not like it. Um, I had like it, it went on, it stays on for like maybe a good 10, 15 minutes and then it shuts off like it would turn back off again. So the virtual machine itself, I just want you to know that it is a little bit unstable, even when you try to install the other files and get it going, because it's trying to simulate using a lot of resources within that virtual machine. So and how many, how much RAM did you give the, the NX? Um, I, I gave, I gave the, I gave the NX four gigs. And then I up the VM itself to six on this one because I, you know, I have 16. So I still need like, you know, additional RAM to run the application and my OS for the host. So it, and it was a little laggy and it, it, it went on. And then all of a sudden, like I consistently getting that no local host found error um, for a while. And then I had to like restart the system. But, and then I tried it on the other okay. one. It was a little better, but I just want to warn you that when, you know, even when you up it, um, you know, in the case where if you have enough RAM, it's, it's going to be unstable. And that's why people pay for viral, Cisco viral, and they use for Cisco viral, but it's so freaking expensive. <laughs> um, but anyway. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Do your best. Let me know how it goes. If I figure something else out, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All, right. All right. Bye.